However, if you want to study deep reinforcement learning, don't go anywhere, you're in the right place. My name is Thomas Simonini, and I'm the founder of Deep Reinforcement Learning course with TensorFlow, which is a free series of articles published on FreeCodeCamp. So in this series of videos, we are going to focus on the implementation part with TensorFlow, while in the series of articles, we'll focus on the understanding of the architecture. So today, we'll implement a deep Q learning agent that learns to play Atari Space Invaders. But first thing first, you must understand what is deep Q learning and how it works. To do that, you must read my article, An Introduction to Deep Q Learning. This article will give you all that you need to understand how works deep Q learning agents. So you will also understand the mathematics behind. Again, if not a math guy, that's not a problem. Because in my articles, I explain each part of the formula step by step. So just a quick note. If you don't know what is Q-learning, you must first read my article, An Introduction to Q-learning, and then watch the video where we implement a Q-learning agent that learns to play OpenAI Taxi version 2. Okay, so you're ready? Let's do it. We're doing it! Do it! We're doing it! This feels good! Do it! Why? I don't know what kind of doing it you're talking about, but you're too loud! Sorry! Okay, so today we'll implement a deep Q learning agent that is able to play Atari Space Invaders. So you can see the result here after about two hours of training. So the result is not perfect, but remember that you need more and more hours of training before obtain a very good score. But before diving on the implementation, you must remember that when you learn a new architecture, you must first learn how to implement the simplest way possible with the core concept. If you do that, you will not fall into what I call the fancy hole, which is the idea of directly implement a really complex architecture with a lot of objects and files, and as a consequence, failing to do it because you began with too much complexity. So when you mastered the simplest implementation, you can add complexity, more objects, more complex environments, etc. Okay, so as always, the first step is to import the libraries. And today we'll use OpenAI Retro, which is an awesome library that allows you to play a lot of Genesis, Mega Drive for European and Atari 2016 games. Furthermore, you can add your own games and that we're going to try to do when we will work with A to C. Then we create our environment, in our case, Atari Space Invaders. So to create our environment is the same thing like Jim. So retro make and the name of the game. Then here we print the size of our frame. In our case, it's 210 pixel by 116 pixel by three and uh, the environment action space, which is eight. So there is eight possible action. And what we do here uh, at that line with one outcode or action, that means it will output a one encoded version of each action. As we can see here, it will output like that. Okay, so an one out encoded version of our actions. Now we'll define the preprocessing function. We have two preprocessing functions. The first is preprocess frame. It is an important step because we want to reduce the complexity of our states and as consequence, reduce the computation time. So how it works? First of all, we take a frame as an input. We grayscale the frame because color does not add important information. Then we crop the screen. In our case, we remove the part below the player. So as you can see here, this part is completely useless. And we can also remove a small part here and a small part there. So then what we do, we normalize pixel value, as you can see here. And finally, we resize the preprocess frame. And it will output a 110 by 84 by one frame. Okay. The second preprocessing function is called stack frames. Stacking frames is really important because it helps us to give a sense of motion to our neural network. But we don't stack each frames. 
we skip four frames at each time step. This means that only every four frames is considered, and then we use this frame to form the new stack frame. In our case, the frame skipping method is already implemented in the library. We just need to implement the stacking frames method. So how it works? For the first time, as we can see here, if it's a new episode, we stack four frames, the same frame, so frame one. Okay, it's what we've done here. And then what we do at each time step, we add a new frame to the DQ and then we stack them to form a new stacked frame and so on. So we use DQ to do that. In fact, DQ is a double ended queue, which means that you can append and delete elements from either side of the list. In our case, each time we had a new state, DQ removes the whole this one. So we can see the initial state. And in the next state, what we do, we had this new frame and it removes this frame. Okay, so we have two situations. If we are in a new episode, as I explained, we first uh, clear out our stack frame. So it means um, because we are in a new episode, we need a new stacked frame. And because we are in a new episode, we copy the same frame four times, like that. And then we use NP stack, that stack arrays in sequence. Otherwise, if we are not in a new episode, we append the new frame to DQ, automatically remove the oldest frame. So as you can see here, and then we use NP stack, that stack arrays in sequence. So now let's set up our hyperparameters. The first hyperparameters is state size. So why there is four channels? It's simple. It's because we are in situation of stacked frames. Each frame take one channel. Then we have action size, learning rate, total episode we use for training, the max steps an episode can take, the batch size for training. Then we have the exploration parameters for epsilon greedy strategy, the gamma, which is the discounting rate, the memory per parameters. And finally, if you want to train the architecture, you must write true. And if you want to render the environment, you must write true also. So now we create our deep Q neural network model. This model is pretty straightforward. First of all, we take a stack of four frames as an input. Then we pass it through three convnets. Then we flatten the result. And finally, it passes through two fully connected layers and outputs a Q value for each action. So in our case, it's not three units here, it's eight. So it's pretty straightforward. First of all, here we create the placeholders, so inputs, action, target queue. So remember that target queue is considered as a real queue value. And to, because we can't have the real queue value, we estimate this real queue value, which is the reward for that state and action, plus the discounted maximum expected reward for the next state. And we consider that as a real queue value in comparison with the estimate Q-value that we, we do with our neural network. So this is the first component, then the second component, then the first component, we flatten it, the FC layer, and finally the output layer, that output uh, the Q-values for each action. So then, so this is our Q-predicted value. And then this is the loss. So as I explained, the loss is the difference between our target Q value minus our predicted Q value. And then we optimize this uh, neural network by using Adam optimizer with our learning rate to minimize the loss. So we reset the graph and then we create our deep Q network. Okay. So now that we created our neural network, we need to implement the experience replay method. So here we create the memory object that creates a DQ. Remember that a DQ is a data type that removes the oldest element each time you add a new element. So we create the methods of that object, which are add, which is adding a new experience to the memory, and sample, which is create a batch of randomized experiences. So here we'll deal 
with the empty memory problem. So what we do, we pre-populate our memory by taking random action and storing the experience, state action, reward, and next state. So what we do, if it's the first step, we must first reset the environment, and then we stack that frame, to so stack it frame. What we do here, we take a random action, and so we environment.step action, and then we stack the new state. Okay, and if it's done, so it means if the episode is finished, and our episode is finished when we did free time. So what we do, we finish the episode by saying that the next step is equal to zero. Then we add experience to memory. We start a new episode and we stack the frame of the new episode. Otherwise, if we are in situation that the episode continue, we add experience to memory and our new state is now the next state. So now, we want to set up TensorBoard. If you don't know what is TensorBoard, you must watch this excellent 30-minute tutorial. So, we create the writer. We want to keep track of the losses. Okay, so now, we can train our agent. But first, let's remember how works our deep Q learning algorithm. Remember that there is two processes. The first is what we call the sampling process, which is here. So what we do here, in fact, we sample the environment where we perform action and store the observed experiences tuples into a replay memory. Then we have what we call the second process, which is training. We select, in fact, a small batch of tuple random and learn from it using a gradient descent update step. So, for simplicity, I've implemented a function called predict action that takes care of this element, which is with epsilon, select a random action, otherwise, select the action with the highest Q value for that state. So, first of all, we randomize a number. Then we use an improved version of our epsilon greedy strategy used in Q learning notebook. If this explores probability is superior of exploration exploitation trade off, we do exploration. So we do a random action. Otherwise, if we are a situation of exploitation, in this case, we estimate first of all the Q values for that state, and then we have so the Q values, and then we take the biggest Q value, which will be the best action to take. So what we do here, first of all, we initialize the variables and initialize the decay rate that we will use to reduce epsilon. And then for each episode in range total episode, because we are a new episode, we set step to zero. We initialize this variable that will contain the rewards of the episode. We make a new state, so like that, so state environment reset, and we stack that state. And because we are in um, a new episode, we need to stack the frame four times because we are a new episode, as we can see here. When we are a new episode, we stack the same frames four times. Okay. So it's what we do here. And then, while step is inferior of max step, so we add one to step, we increase the decay step, and then we predict the action to take. And how we predict the action? Using the function predict action that we define here. When we have the action to take, so here, we perform the action and get the next state reward and done information. We add the reward to total reward. And if it's done, so it means if the game is finished, so it means if we died three times, so the episode ends, so we have no next state. So next state is equal to zero. And we stack this, the, the frame. We stack this new frame, so the next state. We set step is equal to max step to end the episode. We calculate the total rewards we have get in this episode. And then we print the information we need. So the number of the episode, the total reward, the explore probability, and the loss. The loss will be calculated here. And then we happen in the reward list the total reward of that episode. In fact, reward list will contain the total reward for each episode. And we store the transition, so our state, action, reward, and next state in memory. Otherwise, so if the episode is not finished, we stack the frames of the next state. So we had the new frame of the next state to the stacked frame. So as we can see here in this situation, Okay, so this is the new frame, and this is the frames of the first step. 
And then what we do, we add the experience to memory. And now the next state is now our current state. So this is the sampling part. Let's work now on the learning part. So we obtain a random mini batch of experiences from memory. States, action, rewards, next states, and dons. Then, if you look at the algorithm, you see that we need to set up the queue target. To do that, first, we need to get the queue value for the next state. So we use the DQ network to do that by using as inputs the next state's mini batch. Then we have two situations. If the episode ends at state plus one, it means that the queue target will only equal to reward. Otherwise, queue target will be equal to reward plus gamma, so discounting rate, by the maximum Q value for the next state. So we do that here. Okay, so here we do a loop. So for E in range, the batch size, so 64. So what we do, first of all, we take the terminal. If terminal is equal to true, so if we are in terminal states, the target Q value will only equal to reward, else it will equal to reward plus gamma by the maximum Q value for the next state, so NP max Q next state. Okay, and then we append this Q value to the target Q value batch. Okay, so here we have the target mini batch, and then we will use the target mini batch to calculate the loss, because remember that the loss is the difference between the target Q value minus our predicted Q value. So we calculate the loss by using as input the states, as target Q value, the target mini batch, as an action, action mini batch. Then we write the summaries, so to TensorBoard. And then what we do here is that for every five episodes, we save the model. So we train here the episode for 22 episodes. So we see that there is a big variability. Remember that in this simple version of DeepQN, there is a big variability. We'll see next week that if we use uh, an improved version of DeepQN, we will have less variability. And then here we test and watch our agent play. So we can see the result here. As I said in the beginning, this is a first version after two hours of training, so it's not perfect. Remember that normally it's about one to two days of training. So here is just a simple version, but we can see that our agent begins to learn how to play Atari Space Invaders. So that's all for today. Look at what we've done. We've just implemented a deep Q learning agent that is able to play Atari Space Invaders, which is awesome. So now, you have two solutions. If you want to train the model by yourself, you need GPU. If you don't have one, you can use GPU services such as Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud. Both offers free credits for new users. And the second thing is an advice. Write the code by yourself. What I mean about that is you must type the code. Don't just copy and paste. Because when you copy and paste, you do what we call illusion of competence. You say, oh, I get it. But in fact, you don't get it. So write the code by your own. Try to modify it. Try new environment. You will not break anything. It's just an exercise. So try experiment. Experimenting is the best way to learn. So I hope you like this video. If you have some feedbacks or advice, please write them in comments below. And if you have some questions, feel free to write them in comments below. Next time, we'll implement an improved version of our deep learning architecture that learns to play Doom. See you next time. So don't forget to subscribe for more deep reinforcement learning videos. And don't forget to like the video. If you like my articles and my videos, you can support me on Patreon. See you next time. Keep learning and stay awesome.